couple weeks ago, I preached a sermon on the topic of discerning God's voice. And I approached the topic from the perspective of St. Ignatius, uh, who was a, seventh, or a 16th century Spanish priest um, who went on to found the Society of Jesus for the Jesuits. And I took that approach uh, because St. Ignatius's life um, and work dealt with spiritual direction and discernment. So I'm gonna very briefly summarize some of the main points that I made a couple weeks ago, and then I'm gonna continue with this topic of discernment by addressing a question that came up in our question and answer time. Uh, so the first point that I want to review is that the foundation of discernment is our relationship with God and with Jesus. Um, and the primary characteristic of that relationship is God's love for us. Um, and once we experience this love that God has for us, um, we come to trust God's voice more and more. Um, so God truly has our best interest at heart and we come to know that more and more through personal experience. Um, the second point is that if we're serious about discerning God's voice, and let's say we're trying to make a decision about something, um, we need to come to a place of neutrality or inner equilibrium about the different choices that are before us. Um, so hopefully we come to a point where we say, okay, whatever God wills, I'm okay with that. Uh, because above all, I trust God. <clears throat> and this neutrality is, is a radical openness to what God is saying to us. And ultimately, that, com that neutrality comes to us as a gift from God through prayer. And then we talked about some different spiritual practices that we can use in the discernment process, um, which include uh, the regular taking of communion. Um, praying with scripture, and in particular, praying with the Gospels. Um, making times for deliberate silence in our lives. Uh, talking regularly with a trusted spiritual advisor or friend. And, um, and then also reviewing our experiences of prayer, and we do that often through journaling. And then finally, we talked about uh, what's called the experiences of consolations and desolations. So consolation is the experience of being in communion with God. Um, and that results in peace of mind and a sense of joy. And then conversely, the experience of desolation is the experience of being disconnected from God um, or moving away from God. And that can lead us to inner turmoil, um, senses of general dissatisfaction and restlessness. And the question that I want to dig into today is one that Bonnie asked during the question and answer period a couple weeks ago. And the question was something along the lines of, well, how do we differentiate between superficial emotions, like maybe fleeting happiness, right, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, that deeper, um, truer experience of consolation or being in communion with God. Um, or another way of asking that question is, well, how do I judge when an emotion or state of mind is trustworthy? Um, how do I know when that is from God and when it might just be my own voice that I'm hearing, right? Or my own personal desires. And this is a really important question right? Because our emotions, they're not always reliable. Maybe not even most of the time are our emotions, are, are our emotions reliable or trustworthy. Um, so just because something might make us feel uncomfortable or angry or sad, that doesn't mean that it's bad, right? Um, and just because maybe we're getting an emotional boost from something or a moment of pleasure that doesn't mean that it's good or right or from God. So we need to have a way of analyzing our emotions and our moods. Um, otherwise, we're just going to end up being blown around by, by our internal weather, I guess. <clears throat> 
Um, and so the book that I used as a resource for the sermon this week is called Inner Compass, An Invitation to Ignatian Spirituality. So let me know if you want more information about this book. Um, and the author is Margaret Silk. And before she kind of jumps into this question of how we can evaluate our emotions, she spends quite a bit of time talking about identity and the self. Um, and she says sort of the way she thinks about the self is that she thinks about it in, as uh, being comprised of three different concentric circles. So the outermost circle is the most superficial aspect of ourselves. And, and that circle is made up of um, the things that we don't have any control over. So that would be like um, where we were born, who our parents are, what our families are like, um, what our personal strengths are and our personal weaknesses. Um, all that stuff that we don't have any control over, we are just born into, stuff that happens to us. Um, and then the middle circle is made up of the decisions we make and um, how we react to things in that outer circle, the things we don't have control over. So, um, you know, I didn't choose my family of origin, but I can choose how I'm in relationship with them or I can choose how to react to them. That's the middle circle. Um, and then the most inner circle is where our truest identity is. And that is who we are before God. And so um, I'm going to read a quote of hers in the book talking about this center part of who we are. Um, so she says, when I move inward toward the center of myself, I move closer to the person I most truly am before God. And she says that this is actually dangerous ground, or it feels dangerous. As I begin to see who I am, truly and without protective masks, I may find serious discrepancies between the person who lives in the outer ring and the person that God created me to be um, in my deepest self. So when we go inward, she says, I will find shame, but I will also find glory. Um, I will move closer to the God who dwells in my heart and the encounter will challenge me in ways that I cannot predict. And this is the power of prayer and it is the risk of the inner journey. So she says that we are most truly ourselves when we are in prayer, um, kind of before God without um, any protective masks. Um, and the more time we spend in prayer, uh, and the more we allow God to kind of penetrate into our deepest selves, the more this experience comes to change us. Um, and, um, and we move, when we move back out of prayer, um, these transformations start to show up in our lives, right? In how we interact with other people, let's say, or, um, how we react to our circumstances. And a lot of the time, um, other people might not recognize these changes that are happening within us, but they're real and we notice them. Um, and so the more time we spend in prayer, the more we become our true selves or who God intends us to be. And what that means is um, the more we are able to let God be God. Um, and what I mean by that is um, what I said a couple weeks ago is that the more we experience um, a communion of wills with God. So the more we want to do what God wants. Um, so we become less self-centered um, and more God self and more God centered. Um, and the author uses this language. She said, it's like the kingdom of the self versus the kingdom of God. Um, and she acknowledges that moving from the kingdom of the self, where we're concerned about our own priorities, our own desires, um, and moving to the kingdom of God, that's, that's a really hard process. It's not always comfortable. Um, and she says that actually, um, most of us are going to struggle with this throughout our entire lives. Um, the constant tug between self-centeredness and God-centeredness. And we want to be moving always 
towards God-centeredness, right? That's the direction we want to be facing. Um, because at any time, any moment in our lives, we can choose which direction we're moving. Um, through our choices, where we put our energy, all that stuff. And this actually brings us to the question of how we can interpret our moods and our emotions. Um, because, sorry, I'm seeing that uh, whoever's phone this is, I'm getting a call from a, a scam. <laughs> that is a false spirit. Um, yeah, that's true. Maybe I should answer. Um, so the question of interpreting our moods and emotions, right? Because um, how we interpret our moods and emotions um, is kind of based on which general direction we are facing in our lives, right? Whether we're facing God and moving closer to God or whether we're facing away and maybe drifting away from God. Um, which direction we're facing is going to affect how we feel about certain experiences. So she writes that for those drifting away from God, the action of God in their lives disturbs them and turns up their moods, creating peacelessness. Um, while the things that come from their own kingdoms make them feel good and leave them apparently contented. Um, and for those whose lives are moving toward God, the opposite effects are apparent. So when God is touching them, they feel at peace. Um, they know that somehow they are on solid ground. They can trust it. Um, and when they are attending to their own kingdoms or their self-interest, they feel that they are not really living truthfully, right? And they experience inner turmoil. Um, and so she kind of uses an analogy to explain this dynamic. And so let's say, imagine that there is a beach and the beach is where your truest self is. That's where you are in communion with God. Um, and let's say you are not on the beach, but you're out in the ocean. Now, imagine you're in the ocean and you are swimming towards the beach, right? You are trying to swim towards God to be in communi communion with God. And there's a wind blowing at your back, blowing you in towards the beach. Um, it's helping you. Um, so if you are swimming towards the beach or towards God, you experience that wind as helpful, right? Um, it would be pleasing. It's helping you get to where you're trying to go. Um, but if you were swimming away from God and you were getting that, um, that wind and the wind was blowing you towards God, you would experience it as, um, you would experience it negatively, right? Uh, it would feel like a hindrance or an obstacle. It would be uncomfortable. Um, when in reality, it's actually a good wind. It's trying to blow you back towards God. Uh, and the opposite is true as well. If you're swimming towards the beach, towards God, and the wind is blowing against you and impeding your approach, you rightly experience that wind as negative. Um, so it's really our relationship to God that determines how we experience these different spirits or circumstances. Is that making sense? Yeah, okay. Um, so I realize that this is not really a great answer to the question, is it? Um, of how to differentiate between trustworthy and untrustworthy emotions and moods, right? Because um, we, the way we react to God's movement in our lives depends on the quality of our relationship with God. And that demands a certain level of self-awareness. Um, so one important tool that St. Ignatius recommends for learning how to interpret our emotions um, is to review our days at the end of each day. Um, and this is called a review of consciousness. So what you would do is you would begin by praying. Um, so you would quiet your mind, center yourself in God's presence. Um, and then with God's help, you would look back over the past day, uh, maybe even a longer period of time, and replay that time prayerfully um, and allow sort of the dominant moods of that period to surface up in you again 
Um, and, you know, you want to make a note of when you touched on those solid feelings. Um, and then when you touched on turmoil. Um, and both of those emotions are going to be present throughout the day. And there's no reason to feel bad about any of it. Um, but the next stage is then to allow God in your prayer to lead you down and show you the roots of those feelings and those emotions, right? So if I got really angry about something, or if I got really fearful about something, what prompted it? And you ask God to show you what's at the root of that reaction. And um, this is the kind of prayer that Ignatius actually recommends doing every day, even if it's the only kind of prayer you ever do. He thinks that it's the most important kind of prayer, right? Because it teaches us how to interpret our days and to track our moods with God's help. Um, so through time, we learn how to recognize those solid ground moments. Um, and we start to recognize as recognize those as times of consolation, when God is propping us up, um, kind of nudging us in particular directions. And then we start to recognize those moods of turmoil as times of desolation. Um, so this kind of prayer, if we do it consistently over time, she writes, will help us to distinguish between the movements of God within us, um, which result in consolation, and then the movements that spring from our own kingdoms, um, or from the pressure of other people's kingdoms too, their self-interest. So I realized that this has been really abstract. Um, so I'm gonna end with a list of characteristics of um, times of desolation and consolation. And remember, you know, we will experience these differently if our lives are generally attuned towards God or away from God. So if we are moving towards God, this is what desolation will feel like. Um, it turns us in on ourselves. We become more self-interested. Um, it drives us down ever deeper into our own negative feelings. Um, it tends to cut us off from our communities, so it's isolating. Uh, it makes us want to give up on things that normally we find are important to us. Um, it takes over our consciousness, so it reduces the scope of our vision. And it drains us of energy. So those are all characteristics of desolation. So consolation is going to sort of sound like the opposite of that. So it directs our focus. Instead of focusing on ourselves, it, um, it leads us to focus outside of ourselves and beyond ourselves. Um, it lifts our hearts so that we can see the joys and sorrows of other people, right? So again, it takes us out of the mode of self-interest. Uh, it bonds us more closely to our human community. Um, it generates new inspiration and new ideas. Um, it restores balance, refreshing, refreshing our inner vision. Uh, it shows us where God is active in our lives and where God is leading us. And it releases new energy in us. So it's energizing. Um, so that's where I'm going to leave it. And... Um, and I'll open it up to any questions or, or comments you might have. And if you do have something to share or something to ask, raise your hand and Karna will come to you with the camera so we can get you on camera. And also, if you're watching on Zoom, um, feel free to type in a question. And Rachel Senkler actually just said, Ignatian neutrality sounds a lot like Galassenheit or yieldedness to God, which we talked about earlier this year. And that's actually, Rachel, I thought the exact same thing and I, as I was preparing um, for the sermon. Elliot, was that your hand? Oh, okay. He's got a prayer. <laughs>
Oh, never mind. Uh, I was just wondering, like, in um, what ways do you see maybe examples in the Gospels of Jesus um, doing this? And, like, I kind of even wonder, like, with the mood stuff, you know, like, if that was part Address. of that. You know, I mean, I think it's easy to see Jesus as already, like, being like the definition of gloss and height in some ways, but I wonder of like, you know, if there are, I mean, I feel like I can think of some examples like in Gethsemane and stuff, but I don't know if, if there's anything that stands out to you that you really resonate with offhand. Or... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the first place my mind went was uh, uh, Jesus's prayer, prayer in the garden. Um, and you know, he is a, a mature enough person and in that moment to realize that the inner turmoil that he is feeling um, is, uh, is sort of like that struggle between the kingdom of the self and the kingdom of God, right? Um, he's, so essentially, he says, I don't want to do this. Uh, but your will be done. Um, and that, I think, really encapsulates um, where we're trying to get, right? And, he, and, and I would imagine that he recognizes that turmoil as not coming from God, right? Because the general focus of his life is on God. So he knows when to, when to trust turmoil and unease um, and when to move through it. Um, anybody else have ideas from the Gospels where that idea would come out? Um, I also think of his time uh, of temptation in the desert. Um, but I'd have to think more about it. Anybody else have ideas about that question? But yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think a lot of the time, speaking personally, I want to know more about Jesus's internal life, uh, but we don't really get a whole lot of that. It kind of reminds me of like true north versus north uh, because it's pretty easy to just follow north with a compass because it's you don't have to do anything just follow it but unless you reorient yourself you're gonna end up the wrong way and it's not exactly very similar because in this case they're polar opposites but in the north versus true north example you're going similar directions but um uh, you will end up in the wrong place yeah yeah and well that's that's really interesting that you bring that up because um, later in the book, which I didn't touch on, but she has, um, she has chapters called uh, Developing Your Inner Compass. Yeah. Um, just a, a thought, like it's, there is like a little bit of frustration to the message because it requires a lot of, there's not like an easy answer that you as pastor can give me which is kind of like what my my kingdom wants. And it's like kind of like putting a lot of responsibility on each of us to do our work for, with prayer and then to get it checked out with others. So it's um, a lot like faith where it's not black and white. And that's, it's like that's always present with faith is question marks. Right thought yeah Lindsay does. I was just gonna ask like what is the in the Ignatian examine prayer like what's the role of community in that like do you only ever do it individually is it something you do with others should you share it with because like the thought of that being the only prayer you ever do but never including other people seems kind of 
off with other aspects of the gospel. So what does yeah. that look like? Or... Yeah. You know, I think um, when he was, he was speaking to, I think he was speaking like, um, not that like I, I make a choice, like this is the only prayer I'm going to do, but it's like, uh, okay, if I only have time on this particular day, on this particular day to do any kind of prayer, um, this would be the one. Um, but that's a great question about um, community because another aspect of um, St. Ignatius's spiritual discernment is how important uh, meeting with a spiritual advisor or a trusted, trusted friend who is also strongly connected to God um, how important that is because uh, you know, there's, you can't look at yourself as objectively as another person can. Um, so yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely in part, an important part of the process. At first, this was maybe just kind of a joke, but then I thought, you know, when you read the desolation list, I was like, oh, that sounds like COVID-19. But then as I thought more about it, I thought, well, the non-joke version of that would be like when you talk about the three cent the three um, concentric circles, it's like COVID is kind of like that third circle. It's like, it's happening to us. We don't, we don't, it's not that second circle where we're choosing. And then in the midst of in the midst of that, kind of what's our proper response? Not necessarily a question, more just a hypothetical, like, um, yeah, what is our proper response when, when we're faced with something that seems so negative and terrible um, and we don't have a choice, but we still need to, you know, move through it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, COVID is a great example of that. Um, so, According to Margaret Silf, who wrote this book that I read this week, um, part of our spiritual development is learning how to approach our circumstances um, or interpret our circumstances through the kingdom of God lens as opposed to the kingdom of the self lens. Um, and so we could experience COVID like, man, this is really this is messing up my life. Like I'm, I can't do anything that I enjoy right now. Um, and, and if we, if we dwell in that space, um, it's not going to be good for us emotionally or spiritually. But then if you think about it from the, um, from a kingdom of God perspective, um, or, uh, a non self-centered view, um, then, that kind of opens up. Um, it opens up more, uh, what would be the right word? Like more emotional opportunities, I guess. Um, because God is going to use you in this situation. Like because, just because the circumstance has changed doesn't mean that, you have, that, your, uh, that your life has any less meaning. Um, because God is directing us to engage in the life that we're in right now. And so if we can reframe how we think about our lives as being kingdom centered, um, then uh, it's like the apostle Paul saying, right? That he can be content in any kind of situation uh, because he's connected to Jesus and Jesus is directing his life. Um, so I think that's the goal. I don't know if that helps or 